Good morning. It's really wonderful to be with all of you this morning. Let me start by reading our passage, and then we'll dive in. Our passage this morning comes from Isaiah chapter 9. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who have been walking in darkness have seen a great light. Those living in a land of death's darkness On them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff on his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior into battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace." Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This is the word of the Lord. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you love us and that you are here with us. May your word nourish us this morning. Holy Spirit, come and indwell this time to do in us what we cannot do in ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. So, it's that time of year again where we start to think about presents and gifts. And in my experience, there are different categories of gifts out there, you know, there's the, there's the flashy gift that doesn't last very long, you know, whether it's the kind of light up toy that makes lots of sound and is like, woo, but it breaks on Christmas Day. Uh, the, or, you know, maybe it's the kitchen gadget that you get from Brookstone or Sky Mall and it's like, whoa, this is cool, but then it sits in a drawer for the rest of eternity. You know, there's, there's that kind of gift. There's also the boring gifts like socks, a tie, a book, ugh, right? There's also those like the safe gift, the, you know, like the gift card, just cash money or a gift card to get like a back massage, you know, something that you just know like hey, pretty much whoever it is, they're going to like it. There's, there's that kind of gift. But there's also this last category of gift and it's not a very common gift. It's one that we don't see too often, but it's, it's an important one and it's what I call the offensive gift. Now, hear what I mean by that. It's the kind of gift where in order to really receive it, you, you have to swallow some pride. It's the kind of gift like a, a membership to a gym or, you know, a teeth whitening treatment. Or maybe it's a little bit more lavish. It's a gift that's so generous, so wonderful that it's hard to take it. It's almost like... I, It feels wrong to take this. This is too much. You know, maybe it's like the young couple that can't afford the down payment on their house, but someone just gives it to them. Or years later, the older couple who accept financial help from their children. It's the kind of gift that makes you say, ooh, am I really that much in need? As Eric said, we are in a sermon series where we are looking at Uh, Jesus through the eyes of the prophets. So we're looking at Old Testament passages that prophesy about the coming of Jesus. And each prophecy gives us a a different perspective on who Jesus was, is. uh, A different facet of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And this morning, our passage in Isaiah chapter 9 shows us that Jesus is the gift. The gift that God has given But what kind of gift is he? 
Well, this is how I'd like for us to structure our passage this morning. This is just how I'd like to organize it. There are three things I want us to see. I want to see who gets the gift. I want to see the nature of the gift. And I want to see the offense of the gift. Okay? Who gets the gift, the nature of the gift, the offense of the gift. Okay? So first, who gets the gift? Well, Isaiah gets right out of the gate and he names it. He says the people that were walking in darkness... People living in a land of not just any darkness, like death's darkness. This is dark, life-sucking darkness. It's dark, dark. And it's them who get the gift. But who are these people? Who are these people living in the land of death and darkness? Who are these people? Well, that is a poetic description, and it is a, an accurate description of Isaiah's time. Uh, Isaiah lived about 700-ish years before the birth of Jesus, and things in the land of Israel at that time were not good. Uh, the God's people, the Israelites, they were not one united kingdom. They were divided into two kingdoms. The northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. And they were at war with each other. And in fact, the northern kingdom of Israel had struck up an alliance with some surrounding nations. Because they were trying to fight off Tiglath-Pileser III. Now, I know we are all very familiar with Tiglath-Pileser III, obviously. But just in case, there's a few people out there who don't know who I'm talking about. Tiglath-Pileser III was the king of the Assyrian Empire. And he was quite the military man. He, he represented kind of the height of Assyria's military conquests. And he was a looming threat. And so here this alliance gets together. And they try to coerce the southern kingdom of Judah to join their alliance. But God warns the king in Judah... King Ahaz, he says, don't join their alliance. So he doesn't. And they become enraged. And so they begin to go attack King Ahaz and the kingdom of Judah. So they're at war. There's bloodshed. There's division. And so King Ahaz, even though he obeyed God's command not to join the alliance, in fear and trepidation, decides to not listen to God's uh, word earlier that said, don't don't join any alliances. I will provide for you. I will protect you. And instead, he reasons within himself, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So what does he do? He strikes up an alliance with Tiglath-Pileser III. And with that means they are no, Judah was no longer its own free kingdom. It was now a vassal state. They were subjects of the Assyrian Empire, and with that came heavy taxes, heavy tribute and so now, not only is there fighting and bloodshed, not only is there division, and not only is there fear, uh, there is now also oppression and poverty. Things were not dark indeed. But here's the thing. This wasn't new. <clears throat> Excuse me. This wasn't new. This had been going on for 200 years. The kingdom divided well, several hundred years before this, and ever since that, di that division, which you can read about in the book of 1 Kings, from that point on, Things just went from bad to worse. Like, if you read the book of First and Second Kings, you'll see this theme that over and over and over again, king after king after king, and the northern and the southern kingdom are awful. They're terrible. They're selfish and petty, and they're cowardly, and at worst, they're bloodthirsty, murdering tyrants. They don't care about God's people. They don't care about the flourishing of the land. They don't care about worshiping God. They only care about their own political agendas. They worship idols. It gets, it, things are really, really bad. And even the handful, the very, very few handful of good kings that only existed in the southern kingdom, they're like Ahaz. They did one thing right, but then they kind of failed at other stuff. They weren't good enough. And so, because, you know, and something that's true, it was true then, and it's true throughout history, and it's true now, is that as the king goes, so go the people. That leadership, whether it's kings, presidents, CEOs, or the chair of the homeowners association, the, as the leadership goes, that the, their personality, their proclivities, their failings have a way of trickling down and infecting the system, don't they? I mean, we see that in our own time. That corruption in leadership has a way of corrupting the whole system. And so what did that mean? It meant that by and large, throughout the land of Israel, people worshipped idols. They, they paid lip service to the Lord, but they also worshipped, you know, Ashereth and Baal 
and Moloch, these pagan foreign deities, and they adopted pagan practices, things like child sacrifice and temple prostitution, which we would today call sex slavery. So, but not only was there moral, spiritual corruption throughout the land, there was social, political corruption. The people refused to obey God's commands about taking care of the poor. So the poor suffered. The widows and the orphans were neglected. The immigrants were taken advantage of. The very land itself suffered from neglect and overuse. Things were dark indeed. Oh, but thank goodness that we do not live in dark times anymore. Friends, I think if we're honest with ourselves, we live in dark times too. I think the last year has brought out the darkness that's always been there, but we perhaps didn't want to see it. Are we not divided? Are, is there not fighting and violence? And... I mean, globally speaking, poverty is still a major issue. And yes, it's an issue in our own country. The poor, are they suffer. The marginalized are taken advantage of. There's still hatred and enmity. And there's moral and spiritual corruption. And let's be honest with ourselves. If you're a person that tends to lean to the left, you probably see the moral, spiritual corruption of those on the right. And if you're a person that leans to the right, you probably see the moral, spiritual corruption of those that lean on the left. But the corruption's everywhere. Top and bottom. The truth is, guys, we are all walking in darkness. And we need light. Who gets the gift? People whose lives are dark. But that brings us to the next point, which is, what's the nature of the gift? Because if you're walking in darkness, what's, what, is, what is the gift that you really need? Well, when God sends this gift, what happens? The people who've been walking in darkness, they get light. The, and that's not just any light, it's a light that brings life. That where there was disintegration and poverty, now there's increase. Now where there was sorrow, now there is joy. Where there was lack, now there is plenty. Where there was oppression, now there is peace. And the, the very tools of oppression and warfare have been broken. Where there was division, now there's unity. Right? And where there was corruption in leadership, now on the throne there is righteousness and justice. This is a radical overturning of everything that's gone wrong. This is quite the gift. What, could what gift could possibly bring about this radical reversal? Well, Isaiah says it's a baby boy. But not just any baby boy. This baby boy is to be the king. And he's going to sit on David's throne. Now, we, we saw last week that David was Israel's greatest king. He represents the kind of the height of Israel's history when things were the way they were kind of supposed to be. And God made a promise to David. He said, David, one of your descendants is going to sit on your throne forever. That's quite a promise. And Isaiah is saying, this baby, is this descendant of David is going to be that king. And he's going to be the king that even David himself couldn't be. But is that really what the people needed? Is that what we need is just another king? I mean, Israel had 200 years of kings, and they were not great. They failed. In fact, they, instead of making things better, kings often make it worse. What makes this king any different than all of the other kings? Well, this king, he has some names. Now, it's very, now in the ancient world, names were not just what you got called. They were an identity. They summed up who you, the, the substance of who you are. And this, his names are what? Wonderful counselor. Now that word wonderful in Hebrew is used mostly when talking about God and his supernatural activities. 
So you could call it, he's a miraculous counselor. He has divine wisdom. He's called mighty God. And that word mighty is like the word for warrior. It's, it's getting at, this is, this is what God calls himself when he goes to bat for his people. When he defeats his people's enemies. Everlasting Father. That's a title that is used only of God himself. And it speaks of God's care and his provision for his people. And Prince of Peace. What is that word peace? We've, we've learned this word before. It means shalom. It's not just not fighting. It's wholeness. It's deep, profound flourishing and rest. So to be the Prince of Peace, this king is the one who owns it. Shalom is not only something that follows him, it belongs to him. He's the one that gets to hand it out to whom he wills. Now, there have been many scholars in the ancient world, and there's as many scholars in our own world, that look at this prophecy from Isaiah and think, well, okay, surely this is hyperbole. Because obviously, a descendant of King David can't possibly be the eternal, unchangeable God who created the universe. There's no way that, it's, it's got to be hyperbole. But Jesus of Nazareth, a descendant of King David himself, disagreed with the sentiment when he said, before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham, our flesh and blood descendant, was born, who was Jesus' flesh and blood descendant, before he was born, I am. Jesus of Nazareth was both a flesh and blood human being, a descendant of King David, and he is fully God. And that's important. And the, Christian theologians, that is a hill that Christian theologians have died on, some of them quite literally, for 2,000 years. And here's the reason that's so important. Because, one, Jesus said it, but two, yes, as the king goes, so go the people. That there is a way in which leadership shapes the culture underneath them. But it's also true that we, the people, we often get the, the kings that we're asking for. Bad leadership doesn't come in out of a vacuum. It's created in, the, in our very culture. Think about like the worst leaders in history. Take, let's take a really extreme example. Adolf Hitler. Did Adolf Hitler create the anti-Semitism and the racial superiority and the violence that we saw in Nazi-controlled Germany? No. He just tapped into it. So, in order for us to have a king that's truly different than all the other kings, we need a king who is like us, but who is not of us. Who is who shares our likeness in that he can rule, he can be our king as, another, as a fellow human being, but who is not from the same, who doesn't come out of darkness, but who comes from light. And the only way that we could get this gift, the only way Isaiah's prophecy could be fulfilled, is if God himself, the eternal unchanging one, the creator of the universe, was born as a human being. And that's exactly what happened in the birth of Jesus Christ. Who gets the gift? People whose lives are dark. What is the nature of the gift? God and man, Jesus Christ, who is fully flesh and blood human being and fully God. And the reason we need that gift is because we need a king who is like us, but who is not of us. Now that brings us to our last point, which is the offense now, I don't know if you're like me. Um, I, I've been a Christian a really long time, and it's, it's easy, if you've been a Christian a long time, to just be like, yeah, of course, Jesus is the reason for the season. You know, he's like, he's the greatest gift of all, and G Jesus came, and he was born, and died for our sins, and yada, 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 yada. Kind of familiarity breeds contempt, right? Are, but are we willing to see how offensive this is? D do you realize what Isaiah is saying here? That in order to receive this gift, we have to be willing to admit our lives are dark. 
in order to receive this gift, we have to be willing to say that without the life of Christ, I'm dead. We have to be willing to say, I, I don't have wisdom. I need wisdom outside of myself. I need God's wisdom. We have to be willing to admit, I don't have the resources to provide for myself. I need His provision. It's saying, I don't have the power to fight off and conquer my enemies. I need God to fight my battles. And in fact, God doesn't just say he's going to fight the battles. He says, burn your war boots and burn your battle gear stained in blood because you're not going to need it. You're not going to do any fighting at all. He's, it, to accept this gift means that we let go of the burden of governing our lives and we let him sit on the throne. And we don't want to do that. That runs against the grain of what our very impulse is because we, we like the throne we like being in control, and we don't like looking that closely at ourselves. Jesus himself said, people hate the light, and they love darkness, because the light exposes that our deeds are evil. I mean, what kind of, when you're looking at yourself in the mirror, don't you like the, the mirrors that have the nice soft lighting? You know, not that br really bright, white, harsh, fluorescent light, right? Because the soft lighting with that edge of darkness, it kind of covers over the, the wrinkles and the pimples and the aging lines. We don't like to admit that we don't actually know what's best for us. That we don't actually have what it takes to live the life that we truly long for. We don't like to admit that we don't have peace. And so we try, to, we try to run our lives on our own. We try to provide for ourselves. Yeah, we might, it's, it's okay to get a little bit of help from God every now and again, but we want to sit on the throne. We like to say, you know, no, you know I, I've mostly I've got the plan, I've got the agenda, I'm going to fight the battles, I'm going I'm to, because you know, I know how this is going to, should shake out, and I'm going to get it done myself. And you know what the fallout is? We have no peace. I don't know about you, have you guys felt that COVID has exposed that the deep level of anxiety we're all living with? Because all of the things that's, that all of our strategies, all of our plans, all of the things we thought, okay, things are working out pretty good. I got this under control. COVID has kind of ripped that away. And so now suddenly all of us to varying degrees are feeling profoundly anxious and overwhelmed. And the, what Isaiah is showing us this morning is that the gift that God is offering us is true peace. If we would but humble ourselves and admit, I, I don't know what's best. I'm, my life is dark and I need light. A light that I don't have access to on my own. If we would do that, he promises to give us the gift we really need. And look, I'm not just talking to people who aren't Christians. Yes, if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian yet, and you're thinking about these things, I would, I, I would please come today, receive the gift of Jesus. Come to him and say, God, I, I don't know how, I can't do my life on my own. I'm living in darkness and I need your light. Please do that for the first time. I pray. But I'm not just talking to you. I'm also talking to people like me who've been Christians for over 20 years who need to come back to this gift every day. Nay, every hour, every minute. You see, friends, the gift that God gives us in the person of Jesus is not a gift that is once and done. It's a gift that we keep coming back to every day of our lives. To be a Christian means that the way we live our lives is that every day we cry out to God, God, I don't know what's best. 
I need your wisdom. God, I'm not strong enough to defeat my enemies. Would you fight my battles for me? God, please, Father, I don't have the resources to provide for myself. Would you provide for me? God, I can't bear the burden of governing my life. Would your kingdom come? Would you be the one who sits on the throne? And you know what happens when we do that? The one who owns shalom gives us peace. Because it's no longer us trying to figure out how to make this thing work, but the one who is light takes control. Are you willing to receive this gift this morning? For the first time, for the millionth and first time. He offers it to you generously, graciously, lavishly. Who gets the gift? People whose lives are dark. What is the nature of the gift? It is the God-man, Jesus Christ, because we need a king who is like us, but who is not of us. What is the offense of the gift? In order to receive this gift, we have to be willing to admit that our lives are dark. But they don't have to be. Would you receive this gift with me this morning? Let me pray. Lord Jesus, I cry out to you this morning as the blind man cried out to you 2,000 years ago, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I confess that without your light, I am blind. I don't actually see what I need to see. I don't have the resources to run my life. I need you. We need you. Would you strip away everything that fools us into thinking that things are not as dark as they really are? Would you humble us, Holy Spirit, that we would finally rest and receive your grace for today and every day? Would we trust you with the burden of governing the world and our own individual lives? Please, for your name's sake and in your, the power of your name, Lord Jesus, we pray these things. Amen.